The Building Better Business podcast is the best place to learn how to take your business to the next level. It's no longer enough to earn good profits. You need to develop a network of connections as well as use all types of marketing to your advantage that will put you over the edge. Hosted by me, Steve Eschbach, a financial executive with decades of experience in dealing with businesses and business people, we'll learn how this all comes together. Join me and my expert guests as we delve into the many facets of owning the business and how to become a good, caring business owner. Listen how making a difference in your community can attract all sorts of clientele, which in turn will build you a better business. Greetings of the day, my fellow listeners, and welcome to another edition of Building Better Businesses. I am your host, Steve Eschbach. I am uh, the owner of a uh, mergers and acquisitions company here in Chicagoland called Trans World Business Advisors. I am one of six or seven here in the greater Chicagoland area. I am also one of about 250 of us that are global, both here in the U.S. and 15 other countries worldwide. We are the largest business brokerage firm in the world. And we are the fastest growing. Uh, We've been around for 40 years. And uh, our job is primarily to assist business owners, confidentially sell their businesses to qualified buyers. We also get into assisting business owners expand via acquisition, if that's how they choose to do so. And we also uh, help them with franchise development, which is another uh, item that we can help business owners do in terms of expanding via the franchise model. Uh, Franchise uh, sales is also part of our expertise, if you will. Uh, This uh, program, Building Better Businesses, is is designed to get business leaders, uh, circles of influence, networking people, as well as thought leaders explain what they believe are uh, mantras, if you will, or best practices for, of course, enhancing the value of your business. And I'm delighted to have today a woman by the name of Maggie Karshner, uh, she is a uh, an independent consultant that works with solopreneurs, and she told me this point blank that she helps them uh, go from working for themselves to conquering the world. Did I get that right, Maggie? <laughs> uh, yeah, conquering the world, their own little corner of the world, for sure. Yeah, and I say that half tongue in cheek and half seriously because um, solopreneurs often have a very difficult time because like we said, they're trying to conquer the world all by themselves, when in fact, they have a huge outreach of people who are willing to help, probably fellow solopreneurs and people like you, Maggie, that do help them on a consulting and coaching basis. So first of all, thank you very much again for joining us and welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Great. So uh, we're going to ask you to explain a little bit about your operation right now, but then we're going to go a little bit further back. So tell us about your consulting firm. It's called Magni, Maggie. I keep on saying Magni. I don't know why. Yeah, Maggie crazy. Karshner. You're an independent uh, entrepreneur. So that's the name of your company then, right? Well, my, my business name is Maggie Karshner Self-Employment Coach. So okay. I do business coaching on the scale of self-employment. So I work with folks who um, you know are looking to be start a business, usually they're really passionate about the thing that they do, but they don't have any of the business skills um, that would let them do that. So for example, therapists are folks that I've been working with a lot this past year. You know, they love working with their clients, but nobody taught them how to be in business. And so I come in and help them find how that works best for them. Absolutely. We're going to learn a little bit more about that in a moment. But as I've done with many of my guests, I have to kind of rewind the videotape and take you back a few years for you. For some, it's a little bit longer, but we got to go back down to your childhood days. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about uh, where you were born and raised. And uh, more importantly, what kind of influence you had from family, mom and dad, that kind of got you from where you were back then on your tricycle, pedaling down the street to where Maggie is today, doing the consulting that you do. Yeah, yeah. I love this part of my history. So I spent the most, most of my childhood in San Antonio, Texas. And my mom before I was born, actually uh, owned a computer store. And so this was back in the early 80s. So, you know, it's like the new technology. And she was sort of a forward thinker, fresh out of college, like launched this computer store um, and was pretty successful with it. And then she had me and was like, I don't want to be working. I want to have this kid. So she was sort of a, you know, former entrepreneur. So I was being raised by somebody who had a lot of business sense and had a lot of interest in passing down financial wisdom to her kids. And my dad was a part of this. I shouldn't leave him out, but he was a physics professor. So he was just sort of like, 
math isn't scary. And I'm like, great, science is fun. Great. All right. But I feel like my mom was the one who really imparted a lot of the business wisdom. For example, so I wanted to throw a pool party one summer. And um, my mom was like, okay, like we had a pool in the backyard. She's like, fine. All right. I'm going to give you a hundred dollar budget, but you have to tell me what you're going to do with that hundred dollars. And then you can have this party. And so I itemized out, like, here's everything I'm going to buy and all the stuff that I need. And, and I was fiscally intelligent enough to like pack it all in to like 50 bucks. And then I had like $50 left over that I bought for pool toys with. And so like, you know, I'm sitting there maximizing my budget as it were. Um, and I don't think many kids had that experience. You know, they didn't have a mom who was like, I'll dangle the thing you want at the other side of a budgeting problem. Yeah. When I was young, I had a lemonade stand and my cost of goods sold came out of my dad and mom's pocket and I never saw it. So uh, I was subsidized, if you will. Uh, yeah, my- yeah. But, you know, yeah, that's my mom a, was about making that more transparent. You know, she was like, I'm going to tell you how money works. Right. You know, that's very, uh, very, very good because that explicitly kind of explains the whole process. How old were you at the time? I would have been in middle school. Okay. So like 12, 13 was probably the youngest. Maybe uh, wasn't more than 15. Yeah. Sure. So back then you weren't thinking about being a pool party expert, I'm sure. So as you were going to school, what were your interests academically and socially back then? Yeah, yeah. Um, Academically, I wanted to be an architect. So and I actually did three years towards a Bachelor of Architecture program in college, um, and then changed tactic very dramatically in my final year. Well, I would say based on just what I know of you right now, that architectural training did come into play where you are today, because you are a so called architect of solopreneurs, if I can say. <laughs> yes, I am. I do love like making a plan and, and seeing it through. And so there's a lot of that that went in. I actually hadn't thought of that, but like, yeah, my architectural training, there are some big parallels there. So when you get out of college, what was your first job? Were you actually a, a, a corporate person working for a company or did you go to the uh, entrepreneurial raceway from the get go? No, I was not a get-go folk person. Like I didn't really have a, a goal of being an entrepreneur. I just had sort of that lack of fear, thanks to my mom. Yeah, no, when I got out of college, I was very idealistic and I wanted to change the world. I wanted to work for nonprofits. I got an AmeriCorps position with Habitat for Humanity, which I thought was perfect because architecture and the degree I actually graduated with was one in geography. So it was sort of like this beautiful marrying of social science and architecture. And, you know, it was just, it was absolutely perfect, but paid nothing. (laughs) So when did the realization come for you that this wasn't for me and uh, I have to go out there and help other people be better solopreneurs? When did that come about? Yeah, that came about, I had uh, landed a job in management consulting. And um, it was like, that was the thing that I wanted to do. I'd been on a a couple year journey of like, you know, what do I want to be doing with my life? And it's not nonprofit. I don't know what it is. And so I decided it was sort of management consulting that I wanted to help guide businesses towards better practices. And then I got into it and I realized that that's like steering an ocean liner and it moves very slowly. (laughs) And I have great ideas and I get a little frustrated when they don't get acted on or at least responded to. So, you know, I was like, I need to go smaller. I need smaller, more agile. And and it sort of hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, oh, I need to help people be self-employed. Oh, that means I need to be self-employed myself. And like, that's when I was like, oh, I have to be an entrepreneur, which is funny. I already owned a business. I had already been coaching a couple of my friends who own their own businesses. Like there was a lot of like, I just happened to be doing stuff because I cared about it. And then it was like, oh, this all funnels into like, this is my purpose. This is what I'm supposed to be doing out there. So how did you get the word out earlier on? So you, uh, and by the way, I got to tell you that the architectural interest earlier on and the management consulting, and you probably figured this out, you were paving the way for where you are today, because those are perfect uh, training grounds, if you will, for what you're doing today. But but now you want to go out, bring it smaller scale, and you want to start helping others to be successful in what they want to do. So how did that start? So how did you get your first client? How did you begin to get the word out from there? How did that all transpire? Yeah, yeah. That was a journey. Yeah, because I hadn't done sales. I'd been in marketing, but I never done sales myself. 
So, I mean, the first line of defense, I think with any sort of like, I'm starting a business thing is you got to tell everybody about what you're doing. So, you know, I let all my friends know I made a big hullabaloo all over social media in any way that I had to connect with folks, sat down with old connections that I hadn't connected with in a while, right? Sort of activate that network, um, started a blog, attended a billion and five networking events. Yeah, it was it was a lot of, of hustle of just getting the word out about me so that it, because there's, there's not a ton of de- like demand out there for self-employment coaching, like that's a term I kind of invented, you know, so I had to sort of put myself in front of people and slowly but surely uh, the word got around and people started turning to me and people came out of the woodwork of my past being like, hey, right, you're a trustworthy person that I remember from back in the day. I need help with this thing. You say you help with this thing. And I was like, yeah, I do. I help with this thing. Um, and that's that was a lot of my first clients. And then, you know, it's that sort of flywheel effect, snowball running down a hill. Somebody gets good service from me. They tell somebody else. They tell somebody else. I'm, you know, building in a lot of systems to appreciate my past clients so that I keep that referral uh, system activated. And I'm staying in contact with like my network to sort of keep that that flush. And at this point, you know, it's just a runaway avalanche. So that's great. <laughs> you know, you said two critically important things in that uh, that commentary. Number one uh, is that you need the visibility and you need to get the word out. So you can't rely on saying it once and having them remember that that is the new Maggie. And the second thing, which probably is even critically more important, is that word trust. And it demonstrates that relationship building is is very essential. And, you know, I would argue that relationship building is critically essential for everything, for family relationships, uh, personal relationships, and clearly here in this case, business relationships as well. So mm-hmm. it sounds like it all kind of fell into place for you. Yeah, it definitely all panned out in the end. But uh, yeah, it, it, it is so much about relationships. And I think that's one of the things that I am able to impart on my clients that, you know, we're we're relational beings like that actually isn't a foreign language to us. We're supposed to be in relationship with each other. So it's, it's just including that this business component is coming into play. Right. Yeah. I just had a business meeting earlier this morning before this call began. And the first thing we talked about is uh, who are you? Where do you live? What do you do? What does your family do? And that kind of, uh, it kind of develops a rapport, which I think is very essential rather than just say, hey, this is who I am and this is what I do. I think that personal aspect goes a long way in terms of fostering business going forward, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's so key. Yeah. So I've got to ask you a question now. So uh, you're going to help a solopreneur, and I call them a single one woman, one man shops, if you will, to get them to the next level. So when you first meet with a client, and we're just going to bypass the fact that you're marketing to get your client, you got a client in the door. What's the first couple, three questions that you're going to ask that brand new entrepreneur wanting to hit the ground running, wanting to be successful? What are the first two or three questions that you're going to ask them to see if they're even in the right starting block? Yeah. So I'm looking for that they have the appropriate background and training and the thing that they want to start a business for. So so I usually catch people before they've like left their day job. So they haven't actually launched the business yet. They have this idea. And I work with a lot of folks who have like three dozen different ideas. And so the first thing I look for if I'm trying to, you know, sort of cull through all the ideas is like, do we have training and expertise in this thing? And maybe it's not training. Maybe it's just like we had somebody who wanted to do a chocolate making business, for example. And I was like, okay, tell me about your experience making chocolate. And she's like, well, I made it you know, my whole life, I've been doing this thing. I don't have any culinary training, but I just know how to do this. And I'm like, okay, all right, that qualifies, <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm pretty liberal with my idea of like what training is, but you do have to have something to contribute and you have to know about that thing. If, for, if right. step one is go back to school, I can't help you. We're not there right. yet. <laughs> right. No, totally agree. And then I'm looking for like, sort of the second thing is like, what, what is our starting block? So Have you been dabbling around with having a website? Have you seen any clients for this at all? Have you been doing this on a pro bono basis with for friends? Like, where are we actually starting from? Um, Because I noticed that folks often will discredit, like on my scale, the folks that I see, they're often discrediting the work that they've done. They're like, well, but I only have sort of two clients on the side of my day job. And I'm like, that's two clients. You have some basic proof of concept here. The thing you're selling, you can get someone to buy it. All right. That's where we're starting from. So 
then I'm, yeah. So that sort of second thing is like, what are you, um, you know, where are we starting from? And then I'm looking for like what the biggest pain points are. So, you know, what, what does my client think their biggest block is? And I sort of piggyback in that, like, where are the actual blind spots, right? Because they might be saying this thing over here is really hot. Like, I don't know how to get more clients only have these two. And they're not even thinking about like the, do I have a bookkeeping system or some way of tracking my income and expenditures? So I'm the one going, all right, what about this thing? Like, we haven't even talked about that, right? So I'm sort of bringing that sort of global view and, and identifying what sort of hot points are that I can help address. Right. You may not know this, but you just passed the first initial interview for being a business broker by interviewing <laughs> buyers, because those are the first three questions I ask prospective <laughs> buyers. Is, why are you interested in this business? What know-how do you have? And what other peripheral side uh, skill sets do you have to effectively run the business? So there you go. So if you want to change careers, I guarantee you, you would make a great business broker. Um <laughs> Well, I mean, there's an element of that to what I do, right? Like, I don't want to invest my time and effort in a business that's not going to go anywhere. Like, that's, you know, I, I meet with people like once a week for an hour. Like, I don't want to sit there being like, oh, God, this is never going to go anywhere. So I'm sort of vetting in a certain level to, I mean, you know, I want them to achieve their goals. But like, you know, where are we actually starting from with that? You know, I think um, what I heard from your commentary, again, that I think is most interesting is that you're finding these pre-entrepreneur people. So you're ta- you're telling me and you're telling our listeners that you want to talk to them before they even jump from the corporate executive or whatever kind of job ship that they have, because once you get in the water, it's tough to get back on the ship. So you want to make sure that A, they know how to swim, they know how to fight off sharks, yeah. And they know where north, south, east, and west is in case they need that. So, I mean, what you're saying, I, I guess it goes back to the whole concept of, of anything is that proper planning yeah. and self-assessment are critical aspects to you jumping into that endeavor and then having any hopes of being successful. Is yeah. I think that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, having a good plan is a huge part of it. I think there's a there's another sort of like flavor of client I end up with who um, they've done all the research, they've had they have a plan in place, they just are terrified to make the leap. And at some point, right, like you've learned to swim, you know there aren't sharks in the water, you know which way is north, and then you just gotta jump. Yeah, you do. And so do. I can help with being like, it's not that far off the water, it's warm, I promise. Like we can make this work a little bit easier. So I'm going to bet uh, that you, in what you do in terms of helping your clients, that you have persuaded them to jump and now they're in the water, right? Yep. So they're going to call you up in about two or three months. And they're going to say, okay, Maggie, I took that jump, but I'm stuck with this item here or that item there. And you can come in and kind of help them corral that in, if you will. Am I correct about that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I asked for an initial three month commitment. So like I can be there through some of the big leap parts. Um, but yeah, people eventually, you know, they sort of feel like they've got the hang of it. And so they'll be like, okay, I'm done with coaching for now. But I have clients that have been, you know, seeing on and off on a like, monthly, quarterly basis for years, like since I started my business. Yeah. And I'll bet you too, a lot of the entrepreneurs that you work with, some of them that have more experience in, in doing the entrepreneurial thing, as you mentioned before, they may be saying, you know what, this kind of worked out a little bit to my benefit and I kind of like what I'm doing, but I'm thinking about going now to the other route. Uh, so they probably will ask you that question. And I think you have to and again, I'm not I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical. But if someone is doing A and they like what they're doing and they have everything running pretty well, it takes a while to do. Don't expect this to happen in three months. But now they want to do B. So you'll help them put in perspective. Hey, you've done A. You're succeeding in A. You want to take a track to B. Do you still want to do A? Do you want to totally? I mean, there's things like that you can help them work through as well, correct? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, my clients are very creative. So they're always coming up with sort of new ideas, new things they want to be doing. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about being self-employed is that, you know, if if I get interested in something, I can go take a training on it, read a book on it, like start playing with that idea and potentially start offering it as a service. And I have had clients who sort of do that. 
so yeah, we, I, we can navigate that sort of pivot. Like, does this become, are we shifting the entire business into whatever B is, or are we, is there an umbrella that can hold both of these things? And um, yeah, do we need to let go of A entirely? Like, what is that? So, yeah. So I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile. Forgive me for kind of looking away from the camera, but um, you talk about real estate. So I have a real estate license, so you can help me, right? Uh, therapy. So mm-hmm. that would be physical therapy or some other kind of therapy. Massage Dental therapy as well. Yeah. Massage therapy. Yeah. Dance, yoga, nonprofits. Nonprofits are usually more than solopreneurs, though, because it's usually a group. So and just reading that, it sounds like those would be your key type of clients. But I mean, you haven't worked with uh, Elon Musk at all or anyone like that. Someone in the bigger I mean, is it predominantly the very small ones or do you find some that have, you know, 10 employees that you're working with too? I have, I think the the largest company I've worked with had, oh, actually, no, yeah, I've got one that we just hit 10. So, so yeah, that's, but that's sort of where I cap out at. Um, I can, I can advise on some aspects of, of staffing and employees, but, um, you know, we start to get out of my comfort zone with some of that stuff and, uh, yeah, when when I talk about conquering the world, it's that I want each person to like have the most fulfilled version of their own world. And so if if somebody wants to scale up and like be the next McDonald's, like that's I can pass that on to some other coach because I can get you over the first hump. I can get you launched. Well, that's another important concept that you uh, just mentioned too, where you know you're not trying to be the uh, the answer to every every encounter that they come across you're in that particular stage that's where your expertise is you know it's kind of like you bring a plumber in to repair the sink but if they find something wrong with the heating system well some plumbers can do that but you bring in a different specialist but at least they can get you over like you said over the humps to get you to that next uh uh next phase of whatever your growth phase might be. So maybe you uh, have an answer to this question. What are some of the common mistakes that uh, some of your entrepreneurial clients, uh, what what seems to be common? I mean, obviously, well, you just tell me, what are some of the common uh, pitfalls that most of your entrepreneurs experience, or if there are any? I think a lot of folks hit a place of like, absolute freeze. Like they just, it's sort of a deer in the headlights thing where it's like, I know there's a way out there, but I can't see the way through, which is like, why being in a relationship with a coach is really helpful because like, that's what I do is I'm like, we're moving the earth, yeah. get off the road. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing I sort of see in folks. I think a lot of folks make it too complicated, right? Like there's that story like, well, but I got to have an Instagram and a Facebook and a blog and a YouTube channel. And, and I'm like, none of those things are going to give you clients, right? All that goes on the back burner. Like here's the stuff we're going to do to hustle to get those first few clients then we can talk about, you know, what, how are we investing in, in passive marketing, social media marketing and stuff like that. So that's another uh, comment that rings a bell here that, uh, you know, we're going to conquer the world, but we're going to do it in a series of steps. And then you prioritize what's essential today that I need to get done today. The other stuff is probably good, but doesn't need to be done because your, your most important thing is to get clients. Once yeah. you get clients, the other things can fall into place. Yeah, once you get clients, you have some resources that you could pay someone to help you with some of that stuff, you know? You know, the other thing I hear from you, too, is that uh, you initially have your clients for three months because you can't expect to have all the answers in a first couple, three weeks. But you need to see that progress over a minimum amount of time. So I think what I'm hearing you say, too, is that you're, you're setting your clients' expectations accordingly. Don't expect things to happen very, very quickly. It is a process. It does take time. And I will formulate and help you walk through that. I guess that's what you're saying as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm kind of the person who's in it for the long haul anyway. Like I I love when clients come back to me like a year later and they're like, this is where I'm at now. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. So um, I would rather stay in some kind of relationship with my clients, even if it's not active coaching. Because yeah, like the the journey takes a while. Like I have had people launch businesses in three months, then I've had people, you know, on their journey for lo- way longer than that. Um, so it, it all depends on, you know, I, I'm here for all of it. And at some point, like, yeah, somebody might outgrow me, which is great. I've worked myself out of a job. It's one of my favorite things. Well, chances are you'll get a referral from that person for the next person who's in that phase that they were in. And, exactly. and that goes back. 
that goes back to your earlier comment too, is uh, that that development of trust that is so essential, and it's a, it's a gold mine, if you will, because if you develop that trust with someone else, and you of course get the afterwards referral then it comes back to help you further on. So that's a great, great point. Unfortunately, Maggie, we're approaching the end of our time allotment. Is there anything that we haven't covered during our question and answer session that uh, you want our audience members to know more about or any message we forgot to cover? Yeah. I mean, I think the thing I always try to get people to buy into with me is the idea that like, like we're each special people and we have a unique contribution to make. And that is actually vitally important for a society for each of us to be making that contribution. So like, I need you, whoever you are, I don't need you to work with me. I need you to go be the best you that you can be. And right. so for a lot of us, that means self-employment in some flavor or fashion. And that's what I'm here to help with. Like, I don't want us to be kept in, like each person shouldn't be stuck in this little box by themselves. Like, let's be out there and, and be, be contributing in the fullest way that we can. Yeah. And the other advantage I think you provide too, is that you deal with many people doing many different things. So where someone might want to be a massage therapist, but based on your experience with uh, a yoga instructor, there might be some things that that person did that may help the massage therapist who may help the real estate person. I don't ever expect to do any massages on any of my clients, but some of the principles and practices of running a massage therapist firm might be applicable to what a real estate person would do and all that, I would yeah, say. Yeah. That. Oh, that's that's a huge, I love borrowing from other industries. Like, this is how the therapists do it. This is how the real estate agents do it. This is how the massage therapists do it, right? Like, I am out there like like cross feeding, cross pollinating everything. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's that's also essential too. Plus, your bright smile, I think, kind of gives a confidence builder that's mm -hmm. needed in many of the entrepreneurs out there. So, Maggie, last but not least, where can we find out more information about you? Where do you want us to go on the World Wide Web to find you out? Great, I am at maggiekarshner.com. That is M A G G I E K A R S H N E R. And that has all the information about uh, my coaching group and one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, so check me out. That'll be great. Thanks so much for sharing your, your insights and uh, your advice and uh, everything there for entrepreneurs to uh, hit the ground running and be successful. And thank you listeners again, as always, for uh, joining us for Building Better Businesses. There'll be plenty more of these and chances are we'll get Maggie back again as well to see if uh, anything new is in her uh, bailiwick, so to speak. So thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of the day.